Um, I was delighted to be asked to be a patron of St. Nick's. Um, the request sort of came out of the blue, but it, the, the, when I first thought about it, I thought, what does an epidemiologist have to do with an environmental charity? But actually, there's lots of good reasons, I think, why you asked me, and lots, lots of connectivity. And so I, I'm delighted to participate <coughs> with you and help out as much as I can. And what Tom's asked me to do is to spend about half an hour talking to you about health and well-being and how the environment works. Um, so, in contrast to all the lovely pictures of St. Nick's that Tom was showing you, I brought you this one. Um, and it's one that Richard Wilkinson, my co-author, and I, we use a lot when we give talks because it, it pretty much describes what has driven our research. We're both social epidemiologists, and um, epidemiologists study population health, so we try to understand the distribution and the determinants of diseases in populations rather than in individuals. And social epidemiologists means that the causes of ill health that we're interested in are social causes. So we look at things like um, people's income or education, um, what neighbourhoods are like, um, and Richard and I look at income inequality, the distribution of incomes in societies. So we're interested in those social determinants of health. And one of the things that has struck social epidemiologists over the past few decades is why we're all so miserable <laughs> in the midst of so much material affluence. So if you took any of our grandparents or great-grandparents or a generation before that and said to them, what do you think life would be like if they had the levels of material comforts that we have now? They think life would be like paradise, really. We have easy ways to get around. We have labour-saving devices. Most of us live in warm, comfortable homes. We have enough to eat. We have shoes. You know, all sorts of things that previous generations either had barely sufficient of or not enough of, we, we have in spades. Now, that's not true of absolutely everybody in society, but even our, um, among deprived members of our communities, people tend to have enough calories, they do tend to have clothing. They do tend to have shelter. And yet, we are an unwell and unhappy society. This photo is taken um, outside Oxford Street tube station in London. So all of these people are working. They're not unemployed. Um, they're working people. They're either going to or coming from work. Um, most of them are young. Um, most of them look really, really miserable. <laughs> I mean, some of them look as if they're about to burst into tears, don't they? Um, none of them are engaged with anyone else around them. Some of them are on their phones, but, but they look pretty grim. And this isn't just seen in photographs and snapshots. You know, the statistics, the data we have tell us that our population is not as healthy and happy as perhaps we would expect it to be. The UK has very high levels, for instance, of mental illness. We have the worst child well-being in Western Europe, despite spending more on our children than lots of other countries. We have high levels of teenage pregnancies and high levels of drug use. Our life expectancy is lower than most of the countries that we would think of as our sort of counterparts, you know, the other Western European rich developed nations. Um, our social mobility is low. Our kids don't tend to do as well in school. We have high rates of imprisonment and a high rate of violent crime. So in lots of ways, when we measure it, we compare ourselves to other societies this, this sort of reflects what's going on. And our work has been trying to sort of understand those patterns and understand those determinants. And we use 
statistics, which often puts people off. You know, what we do is in analysis, we look at correlations between one thing and another. Sometimes we do even fancy statistics. And when you go out of an evening to talk to people and, and you say, I'm going to come show you some statistics, they tend to groan. So if you can understand this chart, you can understand everything we have ever discovered. <laughs> which is that problems, as problems increase, um, sorry, as income inequality increases, problems increase. So when we look at lots of different countries with different levels of income inequality, we find that the ones that are more unequal have more problems. It's as simple as that. And I'm not going to show you lots and lots of charts that show that, but I did bring um, two with me. And it's going to be hard for you to see at the back, so I'll try and explain what's going on here. What we've got here are lots of different countries dotted around. So the names of different countries, every point a different country. And these are the rich, developed market democracies, really. Um, and they're arranged from, I'm not good at left to right, I have to think. They're arranged from left to right by how unequal those societies are. So the countries further over towards me are the more equal ones, and the countries further over that side are the more unequal ones. And they are arranged top to bottom by levels of trust in those different societies. Um, it's the percentage of people in each of these societies who think that you can trust other people. And these data, they come from something called the World Values Survey. And what they do is they go to different societies and they take random samples of the adult population who are representative of the whole country. You know, it's hard work figuring out how you do that, but they do it for us. We just pull the data. Um, and they ask people questions about values, and one of the questions they ask is, do you think most other people can be trusted or not? And that turns out to be a really good measure of what we think of as social capital, which is you know, people's connectedness to one another. Um, it's generalised trust. It's not, do you trust people you know? Um, it's not whether you trust particular groups of people, like politicians or bankers or doctors or university professors or whatever. It's just, do you think other people can be trusted? And it's a really good measure of social cohesion and it's significantly related to inequality. And the way I often like to sort of suggest that people think about it is to think about what life is like in a society where more people trust each other compared to one where they don't. So up here at this end, we've got Scandinavian countries, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Finland, and the Netherlands. And about two-thirds of the population think that everyone else can be trusted. And down at the more unequal end, um, we've got Portugal at less than 20%. So fewer than one in five people mm. think you can trust others. And here's the UK, exactly where we would predict, given its level of inequality, and doing poorly on this measure of trust. So if you think about <coughs> trust and think, what's it like to be a woman walking alone at night in a society where everyone trusts one another and in a society where people don't? What's it like to be a young man walking on the street and encounter other people on the street, other young men on the street corner, you know, see a bunch of them waiting across the road? What's that like in different places? What's it like on school playgrounds? What's it like on public transport? You know, what, what are the day-to-day -day social connections and social encounters like? And that's why I think this is, is a good measure of social cohesion. And it seems to be destroyed by inequality. So when you've got bigger income differences in society, you've got a more hierarchical, rigid class structure. You've got more social distance between people, as well as perhaps more spatial distance. And it's reflected in these lower levels of trust. And it's also reflected in levels of mental illness. Now, why isn't that showing up? Oh, that's really sad. <laughs> I was doing this just before I came out. Something's gone very wrong with that graph. It's black. <laughs> I'll tell you what was on it, <laughs> and you'll have to believe me. It was exactly the same as the other one. It had different countries on it, um, the more equal ones over here and the more unequal ones over there. And instead of looking at trust, it was looking at 
what percent of the adult population in each country has had some kind of mental illness in the past year? And the data were collected by the World Health Organization, sort of in the same way as the trust measures, random samples of the adult population in lots of different countries, asking them questions about mental health symptoms, and then adding them up, really, to sort of count how many people had some kind of mental health problem in the past year. And although my data have just vanished into thin air, I could do an interpretive dance, <laughs> slow pit for you. No, um, it's a very strong relationship so that the more unequal countries have much, much higher levels of mental health problems and the more unequal ones much lower. It's one of the closest relationships we look at and it's very, very stark. And on this chart, were it to be working properly, you would see the UK almost at the very top. 23% of the adult population in the UK had some kind of mental illness in the past 12 months. In the USA, which is the only country that comes higher than us, 26% more than one in four. But 23%, that's huge. Now, that's not 23% at any one time, it's 23% every 12 month period. But when you understand that, you start to think, well, maybe that picture that we saw of all those miserable young people is the hidden part of an iceberg. You know, the mental illness statistics are the tip of the iceberg. They represent the most severe distress and suffering from mental um, health problems, lack of mental well-being. But that's got to be sort of a reflection of what's going on with the rest of us, too. And so a lot of our work over the past few years has been trying to unpick that and understand why it is that greater inequality, you know, bigger differences between rich and poor in society, actually end up causing all of this social dysfunction, lack of social cohesion, high levels of mental health problems. Why are we so sensitive to levels of inequality? What is it about inequality that gets under the skin or gets into our heads and makes us unwell. That's what our new book is going to be about. And we're just finishing, or trying to finish. It's very late to the publisher. But we're almost done. So by the end of the year, that should, that should be done and dusted and delivered. But we have been trying to understand it. And look, this one's worked. One of the things that's been helpful to us is looking at the work of lots of other people um, to see how it sort of fits with, with what we're thinking about. And there are some psychologists in California who, who've done some work which we found really helpful. Are, is there any psychologists in the room? All right. <laughs> so I can say what I'm going to say. <laughs> they do quite nasty things to people in the nature of their science. And one of the things that psychologists do is they experiment on students a lot. So they, um, they pay them paltry sums of money to take part in their, in their psychological experiments and... Um, and um, try and understand the workings of, of the human psyche. And one of the things that, they, that, as a discipline, as a profession that they've been interested in for a long time, is what sort of things do humans find most stressful? You know, that's a question that interests them. What sort of tasks do humans find most stressful? What sort of situations? And these two um, psychologists in California decided to look at all the studies that everybody else had done on this question and sort of pull them all together. And they found, I think it was 170-something. Um, and these were studies where psychologists had got, usually university students, into a room and given them something really unpleasant to do and then measured their stress responses, measured their hormonal stress responses. Do their cortisol levels go up? And so what these researchers did was say, what kind of tasks most reliably stressed people out? And it turns out that it was tasks with what they call social evaluative threat <coughs> that most reliably send our stress hormones sky high. And other unpleasant things don't. So if I gave you all some maths problems to do right now, a little maths test, 
A few of you might like it. <laughs> Most of you would probably think, mm, yeah, you know, that's mildly stressful. But it's not that stressful, actually. But if I asked you all to do this little maths test, and then I asked you all what your marks were, Vicky, what did you get? <laughs> Ed, how was your score? And you had to announce it to everyone else in the room. That's really stressful. So it's when you think that other people have a chance to judge you and to judge you negatively that your stress hormones rise. So if we looked at everybody's stress hormones right now in this room, you would all be okay and mine would be, hmm. Because public speaking is reliably stressful. It's one of the things that people really dread. You've all got a chance right now to judge me negatively. I've got a chance to judge you lot because I am sitting here thinking, what are they thinking of me? What are they thinking of my talk? What are they thinking of me? Um, does my hair look all right? You know, do they think I, I should lose some weight? Um, do they think I'm talking too long? Yeah. Um, so all of that kind of stuff. And this, I think, is key. If you live in a more unequal society, status matters more. And if status matters more, then judgments about people's status matter more and happen more often. And so we think this is sort of a key thing um, underlying the higher levels of mental health problems and indeed the physical health problems, the cognition problems we see is status anxiety, people's anxiety about where they come and what other people think of them. And now we're starting to get the data through from different European countries that show us exactly right. In more unequal societies, people are more worried about status. They are more anxious about it. And not just poor people, rich people as well. Right across the income distribution, you see the whole um, distribution sort of ratcheted up in their anxiety levels. So that's the kind of society we live in. A very unequal one that is damaging us in, in lots of ways that we might not think about daily or understand, but in every encounter we have, in all aspects of our, our daily lives. And that's probably why green space offers some respite and some potential for creating well-being in societies where people are suffering. Um, green space, there's a formal definition of green space, which I dug out and managed to get on a slide and it hasn't disappeared. <laughs> green space is formal parks, natural or semi-natural urban green spaces, and that might include woodland, border areas, sports and recreation facilities, allotments, etc. Not private gardens. You know, so it's public green areas where the environment is sort of more natural. And there's been a huge amount of interest over the past few years in whether or not spending time in the outdoors, in the green space, not outdoors in a built-up city like those poor, miserable people outside Oxford Street tube station, but spending time in green environments actually is beneficial for physical and mental health and well-being. So lots of projects, lots of attention to this, lots of interest in it. Now there's all this. There's some sort of direct reasons why you might think that green spaces are very good for the health of the population. Um, they give you a space that is free from pollution. They actually help to counteract pollution. So we often think of parks, don't we, as the green lungs <coughs> of cities and, and spaces where people are free of pollution, sometimes free of noise pollution as well as air pollution. So those are sort of direct ways in which being close to a park or spending time in nature is, is beneficial for your health. And with the news about um, what VW have been doing around their diesel emissions, you know, we actually all need a bit more protection from pollution than, than any of us have realised. And parks and green spaces are, are really important for that. You know, people who live near main roads have much higher exposure to pollution. But green space is probably good for our health and well-being in some more indirect ways. And this is what um, health researchers have been really interested in. So it's not so much to do with the green lungs of the city, but, but what happens to people when they are outside in nature um, and when they are in green spaces. And the pathways to sort of health and well-being, they think there's three really. And 
two obvious and one perhaps a bit less so. One is physical activity. So if you, if you are out of doors, um, you might walk, you might cycle, you might dig your garden, you might go hiking. You know, being out in green space increases the opportunities to move your body and be physically active. And we all know how good that is for health. You know, um, and it's the best anti-aging thing you can possibly do is get out and move. You know, we all know it, so we should all do a bit more of it. Um, so that's really good. Socialisation as well. Um, lots of people find um, or take opportunities to socialise in green settings. If you go walking your dog, I haven't got a dog, but I notice that dog walkers in the park always chat to other dog walkers and there's a whole dog posse kind of thing that goes on from which I am socially excluded unless I get a dog. But you know, people, in, uh, mums take their kids to playgrounds and they talk to other mums. And I was, at a, I was at a What Works for Wellbeing workshop over the past couple of days, and the term that a lot of people were using was bumping spaces, which I thought was really nice. And it's public spaces where you have a chance to encounter other people, just bump into them and have a social encounter. Um, so possibly, you know, this helps people feel less socially isolated, feel less lonely, and social connectedness is so important for health. It is more, it is better for your health to have friends than it is bad for your health to smoke. It's that strong an impact. Social connectivity is really important. So move your body and make friends. Right? Two, two key pathways to health. And then this other one is restoration. And we're not talking about restoration of the St. Nick's Nature Reserve, I'm afraid. We're talking about restoration of our souls, our psyches, our mental well-being. People find and often describe in studies how restorative they find it to be outdoors, in nature, whether it's digging in their garden or hiking up a mountain or going to the beach or just walking um, in the nature reserve or just passing by some flowers in pots, you know. Nature has a potential to make us feel restored and at peace with ourselves. Um, and I hope it's alright for me to mention your projects. Ecotherapy at St. Nick's. Um, St. Nick's has secured some funding from um, the lottery to fund its ecotherapy projects. And there are four kinds. So bearing fruit Tom mentioned... Um, you can get involved with St. Nick's through the Bearing Fruit Program and work on the community orchard and learn about conservation skills. That way, there's a Green Fingers Program, which is basic horticulture. There are connecting to nature, things that are, um, I think this is right, these are more um, occasional. Yeah, so mindfulness, hikes, and tai chi outdoors, that sort of thing and plot to play, learning about organic gardening and cooking. So these are the ideas that St. Nick's has had about how they might engage people here um, in the outdoors as a therapeutic tool. So that they would come together in groups to participate <coughs> in these sorts of activities with some structured mentoring and support. Um, so doctors in York can refer, um, other groups can refer to St. Nick's, and people can refer themselves into these programs. Um, and the idea is that their mental well-being will be improved by their opportunities to take part in these. And you can imagine that, you know, that actually they'll be improving in all of these three ways. Because these are group activities, they'll have a chance to socialise with one another, um, there'll also be the bump encounters when they come here. They might meet some of you as they're getting ready to go out onto the reserve. Um, they might meet other people. Um, they will be active in some sense, and they may find some peace of mind and some restorative um, processes going on for them by, by virtue of spending time outside on the trees and the flowers and in the fresh air. So, the idea is that all of these things will reduce their stress levels, help them cope with depression and anxiety, improve their self-esteem because they are getting out and about, taking part in activities 
meeting new people and learning new skills. Um, they'll be more active, they'll feel more resilient, um, and that they may have more confidence from their skills. And I think this last one is really key, and these all come from St. Nick's website, that they might feel happy by having made a positive contribution to the environment. Because that's another key thing for mental well-being, actually, is giving and contributing in your community to the planet. Um, the New Economics Foundation's five ways to well-being, one of them is give. Another is connect. So, so there's a sort of good science going on that suggests that the kinds of activities that are being provided here might be really beneficial for people's well-being. Um, people who come into your programs who have mental health problems and issues. But actually, it's beneficial to all of you. Um, and it's beneficial to the community in general. So everything that you are doing here, every activity that you described today, the mere fact that you are all here tonight and have bumped into one another and perhaps had a piece of cake and a cup of coffee, um, the fact that you all are associated with this um, charity in some way and that you volunteer time um, and make some effort to be engaged, you're all improving your well-being as well individually and collectively. And by creating this wonderful space in the community, you really are creating chances to foster well-being much more widely. And, and I applaud you for that, and I would be delighted to continue to be engaged with you. And one of the things I hope to help you really think through is how do we evaluate your programme? How do we make sure that it's doing what you think it will do? Um, can it be tweaked to do it more? Um, should it expand? Um, and I'd be delighted to help you think about how you might bring in more resources to do that as well. I've got some great students and research fellows who could be volunteers of a slightly different kind. They probably wouldn't mind getting in the mud as well, <coughs> but they could, bring, they could bring some analytical research skills to you as well. So thanks for listening. I've done my part and um, nobody waved at me at all. So, um, I will now take all my self evaluative threat, <laughs> uh, breathe it all out, and uh, thank you very much for listening.